Welcome, lovely humans. My name is Tia, and my pronouns are she, hers, and I'm the director of the Compassion Project. I want to thank you for your regular support on our Patreon. If you love what we do, the best thing you can do for us is to help spread the word. We don't pay for advertising or marketing, so we do rely on your help sharing this platform with friends and family. When you encourage people to join our Patreon, you power our mission to teach and spread compassion. Last year, we engaged 600 people, 10 community organizations, and five local schools in our programs. As we get started today, I invite you to take three breaths with me. Start with an exhale, then take this first breath to check in with yourself. Next, take this second breath for the two of us. And take this third breath for all the people, plants, and animals that enrich your life. Beautiful. Today, I'm talking about bringing compassion to our thinking and our work with challenging or harmful behavior. Many of us are headed back to school, and so it's a normal time to be thinking about and encouraging the kind of behavior we want to see. But my hope is that this topic is valuable for everyone. We all rub against tension and discomfort. Notice how I'm not talking about challenging or harmful people, but rather focusing on the behavior. This is helpful for bringing mindfulness to our words and thinking. By focusing on the behavior, we recognize that people are capable of growing and changing and stay hopeful and open to that possibility. And as we ourselves make mistakes, if we can focus on our behavior, we too can recognize that we are capable of growth and change. In conversations with teachers, educators, and parents on this topic, I sometimes hear confusion around applying compassion in moments of stress, disrespect, or difficulty. Within the context of this conversation, I wanna be clear, I'm not talking about situations involving physical safety or abuse. But as we are modeling and guiding behavioral norms, I've heard people say things like, what about tough love? Compassion is too soft. Compassion indulges people rather than getting them to change. Compassion is too lovey-dovey. Compassion is selfish, etc." I'm going to make the case that deep compassion is our only way forward. And in fact, compassion can be fierce, strong, and loyal. It can also be soft and tender. I welcome your curiosity and your pushback on these ideas. There's juicy learning to be had if we can hold these tensions. Broadly, let's start with what's working and what we know isn't working for students, for teachers, for workplaces and families. Depression and anxiety in students is at an all time high. Teachers are leaving the profession or feeling burned out. Workplaces have low morale and high turnover. Families are struggling. The old model of being hard on each other, insisting that there is only one definition of success, pushing ourselves and one another to the limits of our health and energy, these are doing two things. One, exhausting all of our resources. Two, making deposits into the shame bank. But I don't want to um, have shame or exhaustion in the driver's seat of my life. But a lot of time, a lot of the time, this feels like the case, especially with shame, because society has literally coded our lives with shame. And I've had to learn that shame does not belong to us. It was put there by someone who did not have our best interest at heart. 
I'm going to say that again because it feels really important. The shame we feel does not belong to us. It was put there by someone who did not have our best interest at heart. I know that I live into my best self when I am feeling freer from my shame. I need this for myself. I know others need this. We have to get to a place of honesty, trust, and support to face and heal the shame. And we also have to have deep compassion um, to change the conditions that produced this normalization of extreme exhaustion. So let's get into it. Let's reground in what compassion is. Compassion is mindful support, belief, and genuine human kindness for others, ourselves, and the environment. Compassion recognizes that we are all connected, and because we are all connected, we are all in relationships. We are in relationships with our neighbors, coworkers, friends, and family. We are in relationships with complete strangers and people all over the world. We are in relationship with all living things. The land, the water we drink, the air we breathe. By recognizing our place within this massive ecosystem, it opens up new opportunities for mindfulness, greater awareness and appreciation for all that we share, and an undeniable responsibility and capacity to build a better future. So what do we do then when we rub up against disrespect, tension, harm, hoarding, dishonesty, etc.? Notice here I'm not talking about emotions. Emotions are not harmful on their own. Emotions are signposts guiding us toward what we need. If someone is expressing an emotion like anger, loneliness, or confusion, for example, that's a signal, not a problem. Even if we are struggling to process the emotion or cannot identify with the emotion. I think a valuable future talk would be on compassion and emotions. So here are my tips from Compassion Project. First, we should acknowledge that we are living in the imagination of people that came before us. We are living in a world filled with unnecessary harm, suffering, and trauma. There is plenty of food to eat, plenty of places to live, and an abundance of water on this planet for all of us to thrive. Yet every single day, basic needs go unmet right here in our community. Someone imagined these systems of control, domination, and scarcity. So of course, some days, all we know how to do is control, dominate, and hoard things from one another. I'm going to say that again because it feels so important. Someone imagined, specifically someone in power imagined, these systems of control, domination, and scarcity. So of course some days, all we know how to do is control, dominate, and hoard things from one another. I'm not excusing this behavior. I'm saying it makes sense. No one is perfect. We're all swimming in this inheritance together. But what matters is whether or not we willfully ignore or avoid opportunities to grow. Secondly, it's helpful to check assumptions at the door. I have a visual for this. Imagine an iceberg, huge floating blue iceberg. Imagine approaching this gorgeous iceberg in a small rowboat. You look up and see where the sky embraces the ice, and it's massive. But if you were to put on a warm diving suit and go underneath the water, you would realize that 90% of the iceberg is under the surface. People are like icebergs. <laughs> we can only see and understand a fraction of someone's life experience. We only know a small part of someone's story. 
and we will never be able to see the entirety of the iceberg. This is true even of children or close friends. We don't and cannot know everything about them. And to be in compassion, we need to surrender to this mystery. To summarize, we've established that one, the vast majority of harmful behavior stems from unmet needs and systemic problems and the unhelpful coping strategies we learn to survive those conditions. Two, there is so much we don't know about our fellow human beings, and so let's check our assumptions at the door. And thirdly, even as we can surrender to the mystery of ourselves and others, we do know that humans, as humans, we have a lot of the same core needs. We all need to feel safe and cared for. We all need to feel loved and accepted for who we are. We all need to feel seen, and we all need to feel that we belong. I know none of these strategies offers a quick fix. This is an ongoing practice, and I'm in it with you. Before I sign off today, I want to bring up one more idea. What do compassionate consequences look like? I think we can all recognize that sometimes consequences are necessary. Harkening back to what I said before, compassion is rooted in relationship, right? So this means it's an ongoing practice and exploration of boundaries, expectations, communication, and consequences. I want to highlight the intentionality behind the word consequence rather than punishment. I love this quote from Adrienne Marie Brown where she says, I want satisfying consequences that actually end cycles of harm, generate safety, and deepen movement. That's from page 60 of We Will Not Cancel Us. What an intriguing combination, right? Satisfying consequences. When you are in a stressful situation, and I know how hard this is, but I want us to try together. I want you to take a deep breath and remember, it isn't satisfying to punish people. It can actually be traumatizing to punish or traumatize people, which is why this cycle continues. Compassion doesn't mean we don't respond when people cause harm or are disrespectful. We don't let people do whatever they want but we can create consequences that are right-sized and relevant to the harm that happened and the change that needs to take place. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. I'm going to leave us with a three-part framework for bringing compassion to these tough and messy situations. Be mindful, find common ground, and take action from a place of mutual love. I want to thank and acknowledge Prentice Hemphill, Sonia Renee Taylor, Miriam Kaba, and Adrian Marie Brown for sharpening my thinking around this topic. I'm in a course right now with Sonia and Adrian, and I feel deeply indebted to them. Please go support their work. Please engage with the discussion questions. Please share your innate wisdom and brilliance with this community, and take care, everybody.